Rick and Morty the anime has come and gone, and the Rick and Morty fandom seems to have unilaterally met the entire thing with a resounding, why does this exist? Personally, I was pretty curious to see what Rick and Morty might look like through the mind of a completely different creative from an entirely different culture, particularly because some of those previous Rick and Morty anime shorts were very cool. However, what we've ended up with, I think, was something far too ambitious for its own good, and a bit too far removed from why people like the original Rick and Morty in the first place. That isn't to say I thought it was all bad, there are some really interesting ideas within this project, but I do not think Adult Swim or the creatives behind this project did themselves any favors in how this story was presented to us. Just untangling the story of Rick and Morty the anime is not particularly easy in itself, so today let's try our best to navigate this entire project and not only make sense of the narrative, but the thought process in producing it. So I do think that one of the major failures of Rick and Morty the anime was in how it was sold and presented to the audience. I do not think it was made very clear exactly what this thing was supposed to be. Reading through the comments on Twitter and Reddit and various YouTube videos, there were countless people just confused as to why this didn't feel at all like Rick and Morty. And that, to me, is a failure in marketing, because in my mind, I don't see any reason to make Rick and Morty the anime if it's just going to feel like the original show. What's the point in that? But I also think your marketing needs to reflect this. Now, some of the people behind the show did make this kind of clear. We didn't want to marvelize it. We just wanted this to feel like another artist's take on the material. But I don't think the advertising itself really pushed this concept. So I think a lot of people went in expecting this to feel like Rick and Morty and not like a completely different creative endeavor using the characters and backdrop of the Rick and Morty universe. Adult Swim should have done a much better job selling this idea to the audience, but I also think that maybe Adult Swim should have questioned if there was as much of an appetite for this as they seemed to think there was. Sure, the Rick and Morty anime shorts did mostly very well on YouTube, but when making a full-on series, I think maybe they should have considered finding a bit of middle ground between the irreverent nature of the original show and the very serious and confusing tone and story of this anime. Especially because some of the anime shorts by the series creator, Takashi Sano, felt like they had an entirely different tone and pace than this series does. Rick and Morty vs. Genocider is much more straightforward and action-heavy. It's a cool short, and they took a very different approach for this show. Takashi Sano wrote and directed and designed and key animated every single episode. That in itself is just a completely different workflow than the incredibly collaborative process taken for the mainline Rick and Morty series. And for Sano, it was a little bit less about writing a Rick and Morty story and more about really using the world as the foundation for his own storytelling. For him, the process was to deconstruct it and to refit it. And it's kind of like a puzzle that, that, that he, had to, he had to put together. And so um, that's the approach that he took um, while, while making his own version of Rick and Morty. Now, right off the bat, I want to say, no, I did not particularly like Rick and Morty the anime. However, I was pretty disappointed to see so many content creators quickly go all in on videos, adding to the chorus of, wow, this thing sucks. Not because it didn't suck, but because so many people did this after one single episode had released, and that premiere episode makes it abundantly clear that this story is not being told linearly. That isn't to say that this makes the premiere easier to watch or lets it off the hook narratively, but I guess I just didn't find much value value in the commentary that largely stated, I didn't understand what was happening, when it was clear the intention for the story was to be initially confusing. I understand why people didn't enjoy watching that first episode, but at the very least I would have hoped people would have given the show the opportunity to add the context it's obviously foreshadowing and make the non-linear premiere make more sense. I do also understand that this is often my approach when critiquing things. I always try my best to meet things on their level and understand the tone and story they're trying to tell, even if those things don't always work for me. This series has the baggage of a pretty demanding and exacting fan base that is not afraid to share their opinion on how things should be. And so without properly conveying exactly what this anime was trying to do ahead of time, it's pretty understandable that the fan base didn't have much interest in waiting for that needed context. Now, did the eventual context make the story work? No, not entirely, but some of it did work, and I do think the non 
nonlinear storytelling in the premiere lends to the entire anime's central device, which is that this new character, Elle, experiences all of time non-linearly herself. Every experience Elle has or will have in the past and the future exists in her mind as memories already. And I think the premiere is trying to invoke this idea by jumping between various moments in time in a jumbled way. Again, that isn't to say this works. I think that perhaps Takashi Sano intended for this jumbled mystery to be more compelling than it actually was. People were far more confused than intrigued, and that is why they didn't give it the time of day. I think it was too ambitious right off the bat, but many of the issues I had with the confusing premiere did pay off in interesting ways later in the series, though other aspects remained very confusing to me and still remain very confusing to me. It's easy to understand why people were confused watching the premiere episode Girl Who Manipulates Time, even though that title should maybe have been a little bit of a giveaway, but it really felt like it was just doing way too much. Not only did they choose to portray things non-linearly, jumbling up the series of events, and showcasing an older Morty's death without any real explanation, Elle. but they also explained that for much of the episode, Morty was spending his time within a VR game slash world. This is way too much of a hat on a hat if you ask me, because the audience is fully under the impression that the jumbly mess of events in time are happening within a VR game, and they don't really clarify why this was happening until the eighth episode of the show. I meant for it to be virtual, but I, I used some portal liquid to make the experience seem more real and a different dimension got mixed in. I think things like this would have gone a really long way if they had just simply been explained sooner. Other aspects of this story sort of hinge on the eventual reveals that recontextualize scenes we've already seen, but the whole VR angle mostly just confuses the more important L narrative that they're trying to tell. But this first episode was meant to briefly introduce us to L and hint at her prior connection slash relationship with Morty. It was also supposed to introduce us to long-haired Rick and also to Frank, who is still the biggest, most confusing element in the story to me, but we'll get to him later. And all things considered, throughout the giant web of a narrative they're telling in this intentionally confusing and non-linear fashion, I did find some of these characters and ideas relatively compelling across the series, mainly the characters L, Long-Haired Rick, and Space Morty. Now, I presume that because L perceives time all at once, this was why they made the creative decision to showcase the chronological narrative completely non-chronologically, not just in the premiere, but across the whole show. God, this is just such a weird narrative to try and talk about, simply because it is so jumbled so I think it's maybe best to go through it chronologically. Looking at things from a bird's eye view, the backstory is most everything involving long-haired Rick, Space Morty, and the alien version of L. Whereas everything that is happening in the present, for lack of a better term, primarily involves our Rick, Morty, the Smith family, and human L. And the real bulk of this backstory is told in episodes 3, 4, 6, and 7. L is from an alien species that can perceive the future and past simultaneously. She can perceive the moment of her death at the moment of her birth. This is a species that the Galactic Federation has wiped out entirely, making El the last surviving member of that species. Meanwhile, this dimension follows this long-haired version of Rick, as well as Space Morty, who is a much cooler, warrior-like version of Morty. Basically, these characters meet, fall in love, and with El's support, both as a partner and warrior, Space Morty becomes this monumentally important freedom fighter in his dimension. I feel like the two of us can do anything when we're together! However, after falling in love and achieving success beyond Beyond his wildest dreams, on one of their missions, Space Morty is killed. I think the most interesting thing this narrative does is ruminate on the idea of free will. For a character like Elle, free will only exists moment to moment, because she already knows the entirety of her own story. So she knew Morty would be killed on this mission. I've been experiencing this moment for all eternity. And so, for a character like Elle, who because of the nature of her species doesn't really get to experience free will in the same way others do, she sort of plays with fate as a means to achieve her own kind of free will. I know that sounds like nonsense, but hear me out. Elle's solution is to convince Long-Haired Rick to do an experiment with her in which they convert her body into antimatter, which essentially will either restart the universe or make time flow backwards. As it turns out, Long-Haired Rick realizes that he and Elle have been doing this experiment over and over again. We've been doing the same experiment in an infinite loop, haven't we? Basically, Elle's gambit is that if they do this experiment enough times, continually 
resetting their universe, eventually the chaos of that process will change something in the ensuing universe enough to change their fate entirely, so that she won't have to just experience the same life over and over again, and might find one where she can continue to live with Morty. And the universe where this happens is the one we follow for most of this story, where the human version of Elle finally reunites with this main universe's Morty. I just knew it. I knew we'd see each other again. It really is a complete mess of a narrative. It's wildly confusing and yada yadas over the most important sci-fi devices, but I respect the ideas it's exploring for the characters at the very least. I think Elle's conundrum is really compelling. It honestly almost reads like Takashi Sano incorporating his own writer's point of view into a narrative in a more creative way. A character who knows how everything will turn out and sees the story as a whole, just like a writer does when looking back or forward at something they've written or are going to write. I just think this is a really fascinating motivation for a character. It's a real escalation of a thing that many people actually feel, as though their life has been written for them and there's nothing they can do to change the trajectory of that life, and here is a character for whom this is quite literally the case. And yet, she does still find a way. She is unable to rewrite the story herself, so instead, she finds a way to change how the story is written, if that tracks at all for you. Okay, let's talk Rick. In general, the Ricks portrayed in Rick and Morty the anime are a tiny bit kinder and more sentimental than the ones we see in the main series, but we particularly see this in long-haired Rick. And because of Elle's gambit, where she's helped set in motion this experiment that restarts the universe, long-haired Rick has basically unknowingly lived through the loss of his Morty over and over again. Again. And though he doesn't remember each one, it's basically implied that he sort of feels that this has happened over and over. He feels that collective loss. And because of this, he does something differently that actually ends up being the thing that changes the ensuing universe. Do me a favor when you see me again and tell me this. There is meaning to be found in the meaningless. A lot of the logic for the sci-fi aspects of the series is really flimsy, but it all stems from a desire to explore core aspects of the humanity of these characters. And in a way, they are sort of dissecting aspects of the original show as well. I think there is meaning to be found in the meaningless is honestly a pretty decent way to boil down the themes of Rick and Morty and Rick's character in the main series. It also feels like the series was meant to have a bit more focus on the ongoing narrative and less on episodic stories, sort of the opposite of what we see in the mainline show. However, I think because the anime story asks so many confusing questions, it makes those detours into more episodic fare stand out even more, and almost distract from the bigger picture, even if they do come back into play later. The episode I think of most specifically in this regard is episode 5, which veers off into a Jerry-centric story. Honestly, Jerry in general is treated very strangely in this series. Even though I see how they were sort of trying to subvert the existing Jerry, and a lot of the show seems to be about how our surrounding circumstances can change change who we become, I think Jerry is seen as slightly less pathetic overall. Rick defends him in ways that mainline Rick would not be caught dead doing. Jerry knows how to get things done when the chips are down, trust me! But this fifth episode explores this most thoroughly, with a flashback to the jacked cronenberg Jerry, dropping into this dimension to try and teach this Jerry to be more heroic, and he ends up donning this whole superhero persona, complete with spandex and a huge sword. I think the one thing I found really interesting about this idea, and how it's implemented later, is that Jerry asked Rick for a mind wipe, Morty's mind blower style, so Jerry's entire superhero persona exists in this memory vial that can be reintegrated into Jerry at any time, which is very superhero. It's very He-Man and Power Sword, sort of Billy Batson Shazami, even a little Bruce Banner Incredible Hulky, a trigger to turn him into the superhero, and honestly a really fun way to integrate this device from Rick and Morty lore into a more traditional superhero trope. That being said, this episode really does feel like such a detour, and I think it represents my issues with this show as a whole pretty well. It's got a lot of interesting ideas that are just buried in a really confusing package. A package that is not particularly fun to watch. Where it has ambitious concepts, it fails to showcase them in execution. The series culminates in this big, epic final battle against the Galactic Federation in episodes 8 and 9. Rick and Morty discover Elle's fate-based gambit and are faced with the consequences of it as well, to save Elle or to save their dimension. What do you want to do, Morty? Huh? She might want you to be the one who decides. In that big battle, Summer fights in a giant mech, Beth is relatively badass with a gun, and it even loops superhero Jerry back in, so that detour did at least serve a purpose. Overall, it's 
fine. Sort of mindless action, which I guess is what was so cool about Rick and Morty vs. Genocider, but to me, the most interesting aspect of the end of this series are those character stakes. Morty has to reconcile with the fact that though he is in love with Elle, he is an alternate version of the person that Elle actually fell in love with. Morty? The Morty who you loved is dead and not coming back! I wish I was, but I'm just not the Morty you fell in love with! And though Elle's Gambit did reshape fate and give her this opportunity to be with a version of Morty again, it also had massive unintended consequences that are now her responsibility to resolve. And she ultimately sacrifices herself to fix those unintended consequences. Which isn't groundbreaking, it's pretty standard actually, but the personal journeys reconciling with this are more what interested me. And maybe more interestingly, the series didn't end with this sacrifice. They actually linger for one more episode to showcase how that trauma sort of sits with and affects Morty and what he does to cope with it, which loops us back into that VR world from the first episode. And I am once again pretty mixed on this final episode. It basically explores Morty experiencing an entire lifetime in VR and actually living his life out with Elle. They get married, they get a house together, they have a baby, Morty becomes a used car salesman, and it shows Morty live a lifetime of love and mistakes and then his attempts to make up for those mistakes, which I think is interesting enough. It's what the show is sort of about. But the crux of this entire VR lifetime is something that still completely vexes me. This damn Frank guy. Who who is this? We were briefly introduced to him in VR in the first episode. He seemed to recognize Morty. They had some kind of relationship within the VR. I don't know where this took place in time. Maybe it's from an alternate dimension. And then in this episode, he continues to approach Morty and tries to give him a job. Actually, not just a job, co-ownership in this entire business empire. And then Morty's jealousy of this man leads him to feelings of unworthiness, which leads him to abandoning Elle and his daughter Maria, while Frank takes care of them. But who the hell is Frank. I don't understand where he comes from. Is he a VR character? Is he from another dimension? How does he know Morty? Why does he revere him? But I wasn't going to come. Not until I had turned myself into a man who's worthy of you. Why is the whole ending of this series hinging on this random, underexplained character? I, I don't hate the ways it explores Morty's struggles across a lifetime. I just don't know who this is. It's a very weird and baffling way to end a series that already had a massively confusing structure. There must just be something I'm missing about Frank. Somebody explain Frank to me in the comments, please. I really do like the idea of Morty using VR to cope with the loss of L, but I just don't think it does enough to tie to the story we were told over the the season. Sure, it's kind of interesting to mainline this whole life and relationship and see Morty struggle with jealousy and feelings of inadequacy. I just wish it were more clearly tied to a lesson Morty needed to learn through his coping mechanism, through his attempts to grapple with the trauma from his brief relationship with the real L. I think we can expect that Morty, now having lived this life and learned these hard lessons, will go forward in his actual life better equipped. I guess when it comes down to it, thematically, this episode does decently fall in line with the other ideas ideas explored in the series. I do think, as heavy-handed as it might be, this last line is basically the message this show is trying to convey. In this world devoid of meaning, doing what we can to live our lives to the fullest is the most precious and meaningful thing there is. I just wish the narrative was a little bit neater. And though I found the entire jumbly narrative to be really exhausting and hard to follow, I do have to admit that some of the ways these ideas came back around were at least somewhat satisfying for me. In particular, that final tag scene was actually a really beautiful and fitting bookend. The series opened with the Galactic Federation prepping to assault this planet, and this tag actually brings us back to that moment one last time. But it actually reveals that this was the mission where Space Morty and Elle met for the very first time. Thanks for the assist! I'm Morty! Hi, Mel. And it's nice to meet you. Morty. And as presented with this confusing non-linear narrative and the show jumping back and forth and not really revealing its whole hand about when and where certain events take place, this reveal shockingly worked great for me. I really liked it. It ends where it begins with a new context and isn't that sort of what the entire show hinges on? At the very least, 
this series ended on a nice note for me. And I did find the series musings on free will somewhat compelling. And though the sci-fi aspects are basically magical nonsense, they at least explore humanity in an interesting way. And the lengths people will go for love, even a person who is omniscient of the entirety of their own existence, attempts to reshape fate itself and the consequences of doing so. Overall, the ideas are very heady and spiritual, which again, though I find them interesting, I don't think really mesh very well with your typical Rick and Morty audience. I'm sure I've talked enough about all the aspects of the narrative that I did find compelling for people to already be commenting that I liked the show way too much. And again, I want to be clear, while I did enjoy aspects of it, I did not really enjoy the process of watching it. And that's all that matters, right? I think for a lot of fans of Rick and Morty, this is just a bit too far removed from the source material to really connect. And I think that one absolutely undeniable failure is the comedy department. Rick and Morty is a comedy series, and though the anime seems to attempt jokes, it does so far less frequently and far, far, far less effectively. I mean, the only thing I'm guilty of is causing our toilet to flush constantly, which hardly compares. What even is this joke? That Jerry shits a lot? I don't understand. I think this might be where the sole creative vision aspect of the anime really fails, because comedy in particular is something best made in collaboration. Pitching and workshopping jokes, figuring out how best to deliver them, working through delivery and structure, that's how comedy thrives. And even though this is a completely different vision for Rick and Morty, I don't think it's unreasonable for people to have expected it to be funny. That's one of the major draws for Rick and Morty. I also think another sort of misstep in this anime is that Rick and Morty exists in this multiversal world, which gives it the opportunity to tell so many different kinds of stories without messing up continuity or lore. And yet, it seems like this anime chose to use the C-137 version of Rick that we follow in the main show. It felt like the entire point was to showcase an anime possibility somewhere else in the multiverse, and yet, they seemed to intrinsically tie it to the existing Rick through dialogue. He mentions that he's from universe C-137, not to mention it heavily features Space Beth, a character we have yet to see outside of the main universe that Rick and Morty follows. It also showcases the ripped original Jerry who exists in the Cronenberg universe, even though he was killed by Rick Prime in season 6 of the main show. So it ties itself to these existing versions of the characters we recognize from the mainline show, and even goes so far as to explicitly claim they are the same versions, only for the portrayals themselves to be completely incongruous with the other series' events. I think it really would have behooved them to just make clear that these are completely separate versions of these characters, but instead, they sort of walk the line awkwardly and clumsily. And I think that ultimately, though I did personally find some satisfaction in the reveals and the sort of cyclical nature of the narrative, some of the moments that they tied together across time and dimensions, it just wasn't enough to justify how confusing the narrative felt for most of the duration of the season. I really respect the ambition in a project like Rick and Morty the Anime. Tons of the ideas are really interesting, especially when doing these kinds of deep dive analysis types of videos, but in the end, the execution left far too much to be desired. It really feels like a story filled with some great ideas that could have used a few more eyeballs on it to help shape into a narrative that was more palatable to general audiences and maybe draws a bit more tonally from the mainline series so as not to alienate those who are expecting more Rick and Morty. I am glad Rick and Morty the anime exists, but I see it as a bit of a monument to failed potential. And I think a lot of fans of Rick and Morty are going to see this entire endeavor as meaningless. But hey, there is meaning to be found in the meaningless. Johnny! I stay mellow watching Johnny Two Cellos. He talks cartoons, he's a really cool fellow. He keeps you posted on adult cartoons. If that's what you're into, then grab a spoon and a very big bowl of your favorite cereal. Feels like Saturday morning cartoon material. Johnny Two Cellos, watch him on YouTube. Now enjoy this groove and bust a move.